Hi guys. So I'm Karen Miller. I'm the DEO, which means the Deputy Executive Officer um, for the Malls Program. And um, this is our panel on the capstone. Um, come in. Hi, this is a panel on the capstone. Oh, oh, hi, Maple. Hi. How are you? Good to see you. Uh, how's everything going? Oh, perfect. We're just about to start. Okay, cool. Wow, awesome. great timing. Um, so I'm just going to spend like two seconds explaining what a capstone is, but then we're going to hear more from our speakers about, um, about what their capstones were. And I think um, it will be really useful to hear from, because they have a range of projects that they were all engaging. Um, so uh, you have two options in the malls program, and I think in all of the master's programs. Is everyone here in malls? Um, OK, so um, which is a thesis, which is a 50 to 60 page paper, or a capstone? Um, a capstone is a project that you do, and it could really take almost any form. A lot of people that we have do capstones do something digital um, because of the digital technology, um, the digital humanities stuff that's really, I think, quite well supported here at the Graduate Center. Um, although some people make movies, or did you do a writing project? Mm -hmm. um, so we'll hear about that. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then you write a 20-page white paper along with your capstone. So the capstone is some kind of significant project um, where you will do significant research. Um, but it's, it's really something that you would define with your own advisor. So we can't tell you what the capstone is because it really is, um, it really could be many, many things. Oh. Um, yeah. Is, is it usually a digital project or a multimedia project or it could be something? It can be something completely. Like a play? Yeah, it or... can be a play. It can be a performance piece. Oh, It can okay. be, it, we started the capstone, uh, I think like maybe four years ago. Does that sound right to you? Mm-hmm. Um, as an as an option for folks who didn't feel like the thesis was a great fit for them, um, and also because our digital humanities stuff was getting bigger and um, to accommodate the interests of folks who wanted to do digital projects. Um, so I'm going to introduce everybody, and then I'm going to just ask a series of questions, and then we'll hear from everybody about the experiences that they had, and, um, and then we'll just have a conversation, and it's kind of nice that there are so few of us, we'll just have a pretty casual conversation. Um, so, Roxanne Shirazi is over here. Um, she is the di di dissertation research librarian here at the Mina Reese Library and serves at the li as the liaison librarian for sociology, theater, film studies, and the School of Labor and Urban Studies. She holds an ML MLIS degree from Pratt Institute and an MA from CUNY Grad Center. Her research focuses on digital scholarship, academic labor, and librarianship as a feminized profession. Um, and Megan, what's your last name? Addison. Addison, sorry, recently completed her master's in liberal studies, combining the gender and sexuality track with the memoir and autobiography studies in a program self-titled Fem Narratives and the Psychology of Self. I love it. Um, while at the grad school, at, at the grad center, um, hi, she focused her studies on the, on the likes of Britney Spears' alleged breakdown, epigenetics, and transgenerational trauma, as well as Winnicott's notion of the teddy bear. When she's not writing about her tumultuous relationship with her mother, she's congratulating herself on a recent ability to successfully enjoy tofu. Um, Megan Wu is a 2017 Malls alum. Her research interests include Asian American studies, pedagogy, and life writing. Her capstone is called A Girl Among Ghosts, an experimental project. It's a life writing piece about her growing up in up Asian American. She's currently an adjunct faculty member at Queensborough Community College and a coordinator of HR at Success Academy Charter Schools. So thank you for coming. So I'm just going to ask some questions and you guys can respond. And then, um, so how did you pick your topic? Why don't we just go down? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, me kind of coming into the math program, um, my interest kind of evolved over the mm -hmm. course. Um, first, it was like Asian American studies and sort of um, uh, specifically Asian American women writers. And I'm really into Maxine Hong Kingston, um, <laughs> who my, my very, I guess, first contact with her was her memoir, um, uh, a woman warrior, and I was going to do something with that, okay, writing about sort of her narrative, how it relates to her growing up Asian American, and like this theme around ghosts, and everything was just kind of all over the place, I would just call it, and then one day I kind of sat in with my advisor, and I was telling her about all these things, and why I chose 
this project that I want to work on. She goes, it seems like you're talking about yourself. Mm-hmm. So she's like, why don't you just write about yourself? <laughs> um, oh, so and awesome. then from there, kind of connect the dots a little bit yeah. and see how you your writing is um, and what is the relationship there with Maxine Hong Kingston's memoir. And so there goes that capstone. Uh huh. Like, yeah. Oh, that's so great. Mm-hmm. I love that story. Excellent. Okay. Um, so I sort of picked my topic by, I guess I will talk about my process a little bit by answering this question because I wanted to look at <laughs> every paper that I wrote throughout my mouth program and to see what were the running themes that I was clearly exploring because I knew that I was, um, I come from a psychoanalytic background. So I knew that there was sort of these ideas that I was grappling with, but I wasn't quite sure what they were. And so I reread everything that I wrote to try and see, okay, what are the like recurring themes that keep popping up over and over again so that I can sort of re- reintegrate them into some sort of cohesive whole So that was how I just sort of like went through, pulled, I had um, an outline of of like bullet points and paragraphs and things that stuck out to me. I put it all together in a piece of paper and I thought like, what am I trying to say through this piece? And then that was how I chose my topic from there. Um, So I was actually uh, doing a thesis. I took a very long time, so the capstone didn't exist Mm. when I started, Mm -hmm. Um, but I was in the digital humanities track and the American studies track, um, and I started the program right after completing a library degree, Mm -hmm. and in library school, I really wanted to tackle the subject matter a little more. In library school, we're so concerned with kind of like the, the mechanics of all of it, and I wanted more content in that sense, more of the subject content. So even though I came here and did a lot of digital humanities, which seemed to overlap with a lot of library stuff, mm-hmm. um, I was really like determined to get something that wasn't so library oriented, mm-hmm. right? Even mm-hmm. though that's not the easiest way to complete the degree, <laughs> it would have made more sense for me to just use some of my library work to build on and, and make something. Uh, and so I spent a long time just trying to figure out like what what topic I wanted to explore. And I, I came across a, um, something I had had already with my family um, history, knowing that my mother had this collection of letters. And I wanted to do like a digital history project and figure out how to take archival materials, even though it sounds like a library project now, <laughs> take archival materials and turn it into um, a digital project and go through the process of, of turning letters into something that was more machine readable and, and just understanding what that process is more. Um, so I had a collection of letters in my family history and I thought, okay, maybe that'll work. Um, and, and that's how I came across it. So it sounds like all, did, did all of you start with the thesis first? I guess. Yeah. Did you also yeah. sort of start thinking about writing a thesis before you decided to turn to the capstone? Yeah. Um, so then what, what made you turn to the capstone? Like, it sounds like for you, it was a conversation with your advisor, but why did that feel like the right fit for you? Mm-hmm. Right, because um, I guess for me, the thesis was, and I don't know if it's the right terminology, but more academic kind of writing mm-hmm, for me. Mm-hmm. And I could have, you know, just went in and wrote um, like a life writing piece and turned it into a thesis, right? But mm-hmm. the point with, of it was really for me to kind of experiment Um, narrative writing on the one hand, but then on the other hand, kind of connect it back to uh, theory and Mm -hmm. also like Maxine Hong Kingston's own writing. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of like, well, how do I really kind of go in and out in between the two? So it was more like the project aspect was my writing. And then the reflection piece was kind of me combining like um, my approach and my methodology. And by the reflection piece, do you mean that white paper? Yes, the white paper. Mm -hmm. And how long was your, um, how long was your capstone? In terms of time frame, or oh, you... um, the like the how many pages was your? Oh, okay. Um, so I mean, I think the reflection piece was what twenty. The reflection 20 piece is twenty, pages, yeah. right? And then my project itself was probably another forty, mm-hmm. fifty, yeah, mm-hmm. forty, fifty pages. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
So how did you turn to the capstone? Why did um, you make that decision? I think I, I had a great time at CUNY at the Graduate Center, uh -huh. but I did experience some pushback with professors when I wanted to write experimentally and to mm -hmm. incorporate personal narrative into my writing. I, um, there is still a very pervasive academic voice in academia that is more objective. Um, and so, you know, I was told you could, you could do life writing in the conclusion or the introduction, but it, I really wanted to do a lot of like genre bending. And if people are familiar with um, the Argonauts or mm -hmm. Bluets or anything like that, like I wanted to do something in that vein. And really, I mean, and then I, you know, I emailed the department and said, this is what I want to do. Can I do this? And they said, do a capstone. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to get permission first to make sure I wasn't going to do all of this work and then have someone say, that's not legitimate, like mm -hmm. do it again and have to do a whole other semester. So I basically just laid out exactly what I wanted to do with my advisor and with the department. And they said, OK, do a capstone and mm -hmm. go for it. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how did you find yourself? Um, I think that it was more of a kind of career consideration, mm -hmm. just um, that I should have some kind of practical experience in dealing with the digital methodologies. Mm -hmm given that I was a librarian working and learning this stuff. So mm -hmm. that is, mm -hmm. um, even though I really wanted just to write a thesis. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I did. Um, but then I felt like I should do the thing because I wasn't, yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't know where my career would end up. Mm -hmm. um, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, cool. Okay. So um, how'd you pick your advisor? Um, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I mean, I started out, um, I was on the American Studies track, and I already had, like, a couple of professors that I was kind of taking courses with. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, they told me, you know, straight out that they would be happy to work with me. But things like life writing and memoir is not really what they're used to, you mm -hmm. know? So that was kind of when I went through, since I, in my undergrad studies, right, I majored in English. So I went through sort of the English department and kind of looked up different faculty members um, who were here and sort of the courses that they taught and what their focus was. And that was when I found um, Nancy Miller, my advisor, mm -hmm. who kind of just fell right into what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and even at that point, I wasn't really quite sure about what what it was I wanted to do. It just seemed like, oh, seems like interesting course. Seems like her research is interesting. Let's try it out, you know? Um, and then after taking a semester, of her course, which was post women writers. Um, that was when I sat down with her. I was like, hey, <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm about to do my thesis. You know, can we maybe sit down and have a conversation? And she'd be like, yeah, of course. Um, and from there on, we kind of like had meetings regularly. And she was like, okay, I'll, I'll be your advisor. Oh, that's yeah. Fine. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I I definitely had some challenges, not not because, I mean, there's such an amazing faculty here, but because I didn't really, I took classes in so many different departments, I didn't work with one professor in particular over a course of time. So um, I, and one of the professors I wanted to work with was on leave, but I found, a, I did find a really amazing advisor, Mark McBath, who's really great. And um, I took a writing course with him and the project that I was working on was what my thesis turned into. So mm -hmm. I was already working with him this semester before my, my final semester when I was doing my capstone. I was already had a relationship with him. He already knew my project. So it just was a really natural fit to progress and to continuing work with him rather than him never seeing my work and then just sort of jumping in together, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. um, so I uh, wanted to do something digital and digital humanities track was still pretty new. And so um, I had taken the introductory class with Matt Gold mm -hmm. and Steve Breyer, um, but I found myself wanting to study more digital history, which the digital humanities stuff here was more like digital literary mm -hmm. studies. Mm -hmm. uh, but Steve Breyer is more from a social history perspective um, background. And so I, I think I ended up doing a, an independent research semester mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. him mm -hmm. as a digital history class because it just didn't exist here. There was mm -hmm. no digital history course. So we kind of made made one up, like we had a reading list, you know, I read a bunch of social history and digital stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so after that experience, it was like, oh, now that that's reminding me, that's how I came across my topic. What uh -huh. could I do? That's social history, that's digital, that's, you know. Um, and so once I figured out the topic and had already kind of worked mm -hmm. with him through a semester, 
and he was willing to be the advisor, even though he didn't have experience in the actual technology mm -hmm. that I was using. He didn't know that. And there wasn't really anyone here who knew it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But but I, we also had a good like working relationship mm -hmm. in a way. Um, I was stretched pretty thin for time. I had like, I think when I started, I had a toddler and like another kid. <laughs> it was like, there was a lot going on. Um, and he was flexible. Like he understood that. Like I, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't looking for someone who was going to give me a lot of daily, like, or not daily, but a lot of guidance. Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking for, I was, I wanted someone who was willing to just have me check in every once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, and so it worked. We had done that semester. How often did you end up meeting when you were writing the capstone? Um, I think we mostly, we did a couple Skype calls, mm -hmm. but not often. I mean, I actually, as I said, I took some semesters off, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of had to set the project aside for mm -hmm. a while, so I don't mm -hmm. know if um, we'll talk a little yeah. bit about that. But um, I found myself not going to the project. I started to work more. I had other things going on, and I had kind of set it aside for a while. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then it turned out that I just was up against time to degree. And it was mm -hmm. like, I have to finish it or not finish it. Yeah. And so it was like, <laughs> he was on sabbatical. I was like, can we, can we bring this back again? Uh -huh. <laughs> I think uh -huh. I'm back. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. That's good. Didn't yeah. meet too many. Yeah. How, how often did you guys meet with your advisors? Um... We emailed a good deal, mm -hmm. and um, Mark was great in that we set up a calendar right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So he said, like, I want to know what your deadlines are. So I went through the whole semester, and I said, this is when I want draft one to be done. And he knew. He's like, this is going to be flexible. Let's just set deadlines. And that was really helpful for me. So I had deadline one, deadline two, deadline three, and whatnot. And then I would send him it over email, and he would give me feedback within 24 hours. So we oh, had pretty nice. constant communication. Yeah. But um, we only met in person probably three times. I think we met at the end when it was sort of the last stretch. And he thought, let's just meet together. I went up to John Jay mm -hmm. and we just busted it out and just like finished it together so mm -hmm. that we didn't have to deal with so much back and forth mm -hmm. over email. We could do a lot of continuous work together, which I highly recommend doing. That was really helpful. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say I met with Nancy probably monthly mm -hmm. because the thing is, I took the course with her the semester before my capstone. So I think like towards the end of the semester, we were kind of already in conversation and I was, I was starting to write a little bit and kind of letting her see my preliminary work. And mm -hmm. from there we worked on. So it was probably what, like November, December we met and then, then it was break. So we came back in January. So end of January, I would say maybe end of January, early February, we met one more time. And then that was when she told me, okay, these are, you know, possible changes you want to think about or, you know, concepts that you want to maybe play around with. And then we met again, I would say, in March. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was like month, every other month. And did you turn it in April? Uh, yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so how did you do your research? Um, did you use archives or interview people? Any thoughts or comments about this process? Did it take longer than you expected? I mean, I think mm -hmm. I, I give my credit to Nancy, okay? Because uh -huh. um, during my research process, um, there was a lot. Because for starters, um, Maxine Hongkingston, she's been around. She's pretty well known. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have written about her. Mm -hmm. There's still more writing about her. And I was just kind of like, oh, goodness, like, you know, where should I start? And even though I had maybe one or two papers that was around her writing already, I was still a little iffy in terms of which direction I should go. So Nancy gave me a couple of recommendations um, and she looked through my list and told me, you know, I think this might be a good source for you. Um, so I, I, yeah, I give my credit to Nancy. She pointed me in the right direction. Mm -hmm. This is what you got to do and go for it. Mm -hmm. I think I, since I did pull from a lot of my papers, it was all research I'd been doing since I started mm -hmm. in the mouse program, which was really helpful. I went back and re-looked at all of the like, like the syllabus for the classes that I took mm -hmm. and just sort of looked at even one, even classes I took in my undergrad that I like things I'd been thinking about for years. I went back and like re-looked at that. And then obviously my advisor pointed me in the right direction of things. But I think we had such a good rapport that I could push back and say like, because your advisor, I mean, he would always tell me that 
as a professor, you're going to point someone in the direction when they're working on a paper, and it's not necessarily the direction that they're going to want to go in. So you need to learn as a writer, is this advice that I want to take, or do I not want to take this and trust my own voice? And so he would often suggest things to me, and he comes from a very different background than I did. And so a lot of times I would say, you know, I don't think that would be helpful, or yes, it would be helpful. Mm -hmm. So we had such a good rapport, Mm -hmm. I think, that I could... I could be honest with him when he would say, here's like 10 authors you can read. And I would think I'm not sorry, Mark, like I'm not going to read <laughs> any of those. And also I don't necessarily have time, but um, I really wanted to do archival work. I wanted to look mm-hmm. at Winnicott's archives because they're in New York mm-hmm. since he was a huge portion of my thesis. But I just didn't have the time, unfortunately, but I still do work on my project still. Um, I still work on it even after I've deposited it. And so I'm planning on doing that in the future. But oh, that's right. um, but yeah, research, I, I didn't do interviews because mine was an experimental piece of writing. So I wasn't interviewing or doing any of that. But I definitely like went through and just looked at everything I'd read previously mm-hmm. and obviously did all the traditional methods you all know how to do for research. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I took way too long. <laughs> um, so my, let's see. My project was um, a family history kind of project. I had letters that um, my great-grandfather had written to his friend and colleague who, um, they lived in Los Angeles, and his colleague was Japanese-American and was sent to an internment camp when World War II start. you know, Pearl Harbor, we all know. Um, and they were working together and so they wrote letters back and forth and my great-grandfather kept the letters and kept carbon copies of his own letters so I had this whole dialogue between these two people um, which was like 500 pages of letters because the his colleague never came back to Los Angeles ended up settling in different areas and they kept up a correspondence they were friends and they worked a lot together Um, so I knew about that and that's what I decided to work with and I had to learn more about Japanese American internment, more about Los Angeles history, more about you know everything going on in the letters. So I spent a lot of time talking with my mom, and and um, I ended up contacting the other uh, the Japanese American family that mm. um, we had lost contact with. I mean, it was a whole. I spent a lot of time doing this, and it, you know, it tended to be kind of emotional. Um, which is maybe why I set it aside a lot, I think. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then I had to learn the technology that I was trying to use. So what I wanted to do was to not just digitize the letters, but to try, for me, the thing was that the letters have um, a back and forth of topics that one might want to follow. So in one letter, they would like be like, hi, how are you? Where's this person? How's this going? Right. And you might get an answer the next letter, or maybe it's three letters later that they bring up that topic again. Right. So the idea was to try and encode the letters and get these topical threads running through this whole thing so that if I were just interested in like the family history, I could follow that thread. Or if I were just interested in um, Little Tokyo, because they talk a lot about going on what's going on in Little Tokyo. Or if I were just interested in, like, the doctor's family, you know, so that I could kind of code those things and follow them through this whole letter. That's amazing. Did you do all that coding? It was so much. No, I mean, when I started this with with, um, Professor Breyer, he was like, are you going to do your PhD on this? Because this is not a thesis. (laughs) And I said, no, I'm not. I'm going to try and do. So for me, it was like scoping the project Mm -hmm. to try and figure out how Mm -hmm. much I could do. I wasn't going to be the subject expert. But I also wasn't trying to approach it just from the library science side. So mm-hmm. I was trying to learn as much as I could um, and then just do a handful of letters as okay. like a proof of concept, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so I still had to learn the technology. I still had to learn all of this stuff, kind of teach yourself. Um, so it was a lot. It was maybe not the best example of a capstone project. Um, I have yeah, one of them up right. here. I don't know if it's there. It's gone back, oh, mm-hmm. but I'll pull it up for, for people later. We can continue. Okay. So Great. Challenges. Um, okay. So <clears throat> some things about your, just the process, um, and I have like a bunch of questions, um, and these might not be relevant to you or not, but it's sort of, this is about um, 
like your process of work? So did you do brainstorming a lot? Do you do a lot of free writing? Um, how much do you aim to write in a, in a sitting or to do research in a sitting? Um, where did you work? Did you look at other capstone projects? Any things that you think are important? What kind of advice do you have? Like, what was your process like? And then what kind of advice do you have for your mm -hmm. colleagues here? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, in terms of the project itself, definitely a lot of free writing. Mm -hmm. um, and I encourage my students to do free writing a lot of times because I think just from that, you get a lot of different ideas and also you kind of really get to, especially if you're, you know, into writing, you get to do a lot of self-reflection, discover new ideas, kind of like think about things that you never even thought about. And kind of, you get, you really get to learn about yourself a little bit more and also about the people that surround you. So in that sense, um, it was really eye-opening for myself. Um, and I think similarly, while I was writing, a lot of emotions kind of surfaced and I was like, whoa, what is going on? Um, so, but at the same time, um, I would say that part came freely to me and it was actually something that Nancy encouraged. She said, don't care so much about structure per se, just do the writing first. And then afterwards, you know, we can kind of um, think about things like chapters or even think about Maxine Hawkinson's writing style and the way how she structured her book. And we can maybe work off, off of that. Um, in terms of the white paper itself, mm -hmm. I would say I went back to the previous maybe two, three other papers I did for my other classes mm -hmm. and then figure out what are some things I can pull together um, and then did additional readings that Nancy recommended. So did you, um, did you write the whole capstone first and then do the white paper or was it sort of happening at the same time? I know I did the um, project first. Mm -hmm and then went back to do the uh, white paper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because I think the project itself kind of came to me a little bit easier, because um, one, I was writing about myself, but two, in that process, there was like, there was no guidelines, you know, it was like kind of fun. <laughs> like, I got to do what I wanted. Um, I get to, most of the time I worked at home mm -hmm. by my dining table um, and kind of just wrote, you know, whatever, and didn't really care about things like even grammar. Um, um, and I wrote in a way, because at home I, I speak Cantonese, right? Mm -hmm. So there are times in which I'm like, oh, like how would I say this in English, right? But um, that kind of just, you know, you kind of have to go to your inner voice, right? And then whatever comes out, even if it's grammatically incorrect, um, you kind of ask yourself, but this sounds right, you know, at the end of the day. I definitely tend to write in like bursts. I'm not someone who writes continuously, but I kind of sit down. I spent so much time in the library, which I'm sure you all do. Um, and so that was really helpful to be in an environment where I could be, I could spend like long hours that was free, <laughs> that mm -hmm. like was safe and warm in the winter. <laughs> um, but I would say like a lot of my writing, to be honest, was actually more editing and crafting than actual writing because I pretty much took the final paper I wrote and the very first paper I wrote, mm -hmm. funnily enough, and then combined them together. And obviously edited and edited and edited and edited and edited over and over and over again. So, and then sort of like just built in transitions throughout the piece. So it was a lot, it wasn't necessarily me writing like a 60 page thesis from scratch. It was a lot of taking what I'd already done and then making it fit together. Um, I'm trying to think of- And how long was your, right, was your- Like 60 pages, Oh, okay. but it's in fragments. So it's not like in paragraph form. Uh -huh. So it's, it's more digestible than it sounds. Um, and then I did the, yeah, I did the white paper and what was actually really helpful for me and because I was sort of, I didn't really want to do the white paper, to be honest, I thought I'm doing this long project and then I have to write another paper that justifies why I did this work, <laughs> but it was actually really helpful because it made me think about like, why am I doing what am I doing? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Like, what is the purpose? What am I trying to get out of this? And I actually went back and I supplemented information from my white paper back into my capstone mm -hmm. because I wanted it to be the sort of like hybrid piece where you could weave in and out of both and that it all blended together. Uh, in this fluid sort of way. So that was really helpful actually to write my capstone, then write my white paper, see how they were related and then see how they could feed into each mm -hmm. other um, because they should they should be ultimately like a, a, a project that flows together rather than two independent pieces in my opinion. 
Um, there were a lot of questions, mm -hmm. but I don't. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll get to the advice later. So, so okay. maybe talk about your process, and then we'll hear a round of advice. My process? Your process? Yeah. My, me? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm trying to think back. Um, my process, most of the writing would happen at night, um, as I said, because I have the two little kids. Um, and that was just the time when I could focus for an extended period of time. Um, I actually, as I said, I set it aside a few times. The, the challenge that I have found with the digital stuff um, is that the digital part takes so long yes. to do um, in a way that uh, writing, I always found that if I were like up against the wall, okay, I could just crank it out. You just write something, right? You get like your draft out. Not that it's easy, but you have some way to just quickly write because I've been writing for all these years. The digital stuff, especially if you're doing like any kind of online interface, it's like just the clicking and waiting for the thing to reload and you mm -hmm. can't like speed through it in the same way so I always underestimated how long it would take mm -hmm. you know just having to what oh what's not working you know little delays that would make it take longer so that was frustrating and then I just um got very existential and like down about why I was doing it and <laughs> all of the things I thought I would discover when I started didn't come through and I was ha feeling torn and the whole beginning of the project was sharing these letters with people who will learn from them and then as I got more comfortable with the letters and more familiar with them and more close to the subjects in the letters I wanted to be like no, <laughs> don't, I can't, you know, I was somehow wanting to guard the people in the letters huh. and felt somewhat guilty by like displaying, you know, because they, they got very intimate in a way because there was, there was no other way to communicate. I, the letters were almost like reading a diary at some point because mm -hmm. you just learned a lot about what they thought about going, you know, what was going on in the world. Um, they don't always come across flattering like for them, mm -hmm. you know, and it's my family and it's someone else's family. And it's just, so there were lots of like, oh, what have I done? What mm -hmm. am I doing? I don't have any way to finish. And so I actually just took that advice that you hear when you hit a writing block to like write through it. Uh -huh. And so that's what I wrote about. I wrote about all of these kind of ethical, the challenges I had mm -hmm. and how all of a sudden, even though I thought I would want to share them, how I struggled with that. And that's mm -hmm. what the content of my writing ended up being of the white paper I didn't have a white paper because it didn't exist yet so oh, okay. it was actually a thesis it was like a there's a lot of reflection and writing about this yeah, there's yeah, kind yeah. of a literature review yeah. reflection and then there's a process methodologies section yeah. that talks about the technology yeah um, but yeah the, the the conclusions I was to draw from doing the experience I didn't have conclusions and I was uh -huh. stuck going what do yeah. I so my conclusion became all of the struggles around grappling with those issues yeah so. which is which is a common approach yeah. in a white paper also okay. like like when this the 20 page thing um and people um people have really different approaches to the white papers so if you guys do you guys all know how to find the mall's theses at the library um we will show you. Um, yeah, it's on the other tab here. Oh, great. That's okay. Great. Well, I oh, just have to go so where much. I can actually see. Yeah, <laughs> why don't we do that? We'll sort of take a break and we'll show you how to find things um, on the website. And then um, we can hear some... Oh, where did you get stuck and unstuck? I feel like we've been talking about that a little bit. Um, maybe we can hear some something about challenges and advice and then... Um, this is a list of all, the, all of these projects. Yeah, so everything gets um, into the library's digital repository, which is called CUNY Academic Works. It's run by CUNY's Office of Library Services. Um, it's our little space on the internet where these things live. Um, and so there's a collection here that's liberal studies, master's theses, and capstones. And you can jump by year and view them that way. Um, so there's Megan right there. Uh, some of them are available to read immediately, and some have um, an access embargo, so they're not available online yet. So that can go anywhere from six months to two years, and it's renewable. So some people think yours is available, 
I don't know if you decided to make yours available. Yes. No? Yeah. 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 Mine's up there too. I mean, but you can't tell until you click on it to see whether you can read it. But if you're here, you can actually also get, if it's mm -hmm. embargoed, you can access it through interlibrary loan. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so my next question is, where did you get stuck and where did you get unstuck? Mm. I would say there were, like I've mentioned before, there were moments in which um, things kind of got emotional for me um, just because I started writing about my aunt and then I started writing about my mother and I didn't intend to write about my mother. <laughs> um, and again, I think going back to Roxanne's point, right, you are really writing about sort of people, like real life people. And sometimes you're not sure whether or not you want certain information to be there. Um, and you go, oh, like, what happens if my aunt found out about this, right? Or does my mother really want this to be out there? Things like that. And you kind of have to figure out, well, how do you portray your character, so to speak, right? Um, in a good light, in a bad light. I mean, and then you kind of kind of struggle with, you know, your own feelings, too, because, you know, um, these things happen to you, right, in your real life. And so there are moments like that where I just had to kind of stop writing and, like, just walk around, walk a bit, and like come back mm -hmm. into a fresh setting um, and kind of go back into it and be like, you know, it's not a big deal. <laughs> I just think of it like that, right? It's just a capstone. <laughs> and then be like, just have fun with it and kind of just write it as it is. And I think when the editing part came, that was when I really had to decide like, okay, what sort of things am I going to take out so that um, for sure nobody will get to read it. Um, but for the most part, I, I would say I kept a lot of stuff there. Yeah. Um, I would say I got stuck more so in the beginning because it was really hard to find the scope of the project and to know exactly what I wanted to focus on. Um, I'm probably skipping ahead in terms of words of advice, but be as specific and focused as possible. Probably right at the beginning is what I would recommend to myself if I had to go back because you think you have a lot of time and you have all these really great ideas and you want to do this like really amazing, great project. And then, you know, I'm sure most of you work full time. You have lives, you have mental health, you have <laughs> everything that life throws at you. And so um, I got stuck in figuring out like, what do I want to write on? Like, which is probably the maybe for some the easiest part some people know they're like this is what i'm doing my thesis on this is what i came here to do that was where i got stuck was like what do i want to write on what do i want this to look like and i think like i had such a specific idea in my head of what i wanted the project to be but i had i was stuck in knowing how to execute that and i think i really had to um, I saw Marie Howe talk recently and she was talking about Michael Cunningham and she said when he was writing the hours, he basically had to let go of the book he wanted to write and accept the book that it ended up being. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what I had to do. I had to let go of the project I wanted to do and that was in my head and just accept what's going to come is going to be a different project and that's okay. And that's when I got unstuck when I thought like, just let it go. Let the idea in your head go because it's not going to exist like that in reality. Right. And as I spoke about writing, writing through it. Um, but I think that pushing saying it's not everything. Again, this is at the end of the day, it's a degree requirement and it can be something else afterwards. So I really when once it came down to, OK, I have to finish this thing. What am I going to do? Then it was really just getting the pieces to have it, you know, good enough. <laughs> Done. You know, that, that became the priority. Even though it's not done in my brain, it's, yeah. you know, the, the piece, the iteration of it there is done, mm -hmm. the version that it was for my degree. Yeah. Um, so maybe we can hear some advice and then we can get some questions. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have advice that you want to give? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think just have fun with it. <laughs> I think that's the best advice, honestly, because I think sometimes, especially when we're working on these projects, um, whether it be thesis, capstone, term paper, whatnot, you have a lot of expectations for yourself um, and also for the project. And, you know, you feel like you're working with, a, with an advisor, so you have to kind of report back to them as well. But I think at the end of the day, just kind of let things go a little bit. Um, 
not to say wait till last minute, okay? <laughs> but you know, just have fun with it and see what is the end product and kind of like, you know, Megan and Roxanne, you mentioned, right? I think in the pro- project itself might be over, but you can always go back to it right afterwards. So yeah. I think I've kind of already said in my last point, like allow yourself the liberty to let go of the idea you have in your head and what the project will become. The very practical point of starting early, start as early as you can. Um, I definitely, I don't, I wouldn't say I waited too long, but if I could, I would start earlier on. How long did it take you? Um, I mean, ultimately two semesters. I mean, because I was working on it for half a semester and then I spent a whole semester just doing my capstone. So a semester and a half. Mm -hmm. Um, And it wasn't like I was working continuously that whole time, but definitely it took me that whole time. And I'm like I said, I'm still working on it. Um, And I think like build a relationship with with professors early on so you're not picking someone willy nilly. I mean, I really loved who I worked with and he was really great, but um, definitely like think early, do research on professors because even if you don't take a class with them, doesn't mean you can't use them for your advisor. So kind of do research and see who aligns with the work you want to do and build a rapport with them so that once you do your thesis, it's a little bit more of a natural relationship than maybe a, someone you don't know super well. Um, yeah. I think those are all good advice. Um, for me, scoping the project and thinking of it as a semester of work, even even if it's the culminating semester and it's building on the rest of your time here, the amount of time <laughs> right, that it should take. Um, and also talking with the advisor when I did finally decide to finish it, and I knew that I was working towards that. I mean, I contacted him again and said, okay, here's the department deadline. Here's the library deadline. I'm going to try and get a a draft here. You talked about doing that as well. Setting out the timeline like a couple of months ahead at least because they might be on sabbatical or dissertation committees or this and that, you know, and, and just being an open like when you need their feedback by, I think, worked out. Oh, so why don't we clap? <laughs> um, do you guys have questions, or is there something that you learned that you thought was useful, or what are you guys thinking of doing? I, I still don't have. I, I'd like to have a, a better idea of each of your projects. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, your your project, you uh, <laughs> used uh, some sort of software to create hyperlinks so that people could... Sort of, yeah, yeah. and it's, it's there. Um, I mean, if you want to know more about capstones, I could talk about some of the other kinds of capstones I've seen. Oh, just, 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 just but specifically, mine specifically, each okay. of your projects and what... what, okay. what it, and, and, and do they have a future? Right. Uh, well, beyond uh, being just a capstone project on online on the CUNY website, I, I, <laughs> I yeah, I too would like to hear about each one of your projects. Oh, uh, okay. So, well, this is an example of one of the letters. Um, it's not fully on the. Um, so this was my challenge because it wasn't actually just using a, a software or using. I mean, I guess there's not much to see. It's just type. <laughs> it's just type words. You have a title. <laughs> The whole I, call, I called it the Holly Suski letters. So it was a collection of letters that um, they were mostly TypeScript. And so um, it's just encoding them using the specific language called the TEI. Uh, it's in XML. And so you're like wrapping each line with these tags. It's a lot like HTML, except that then it's also identifying when it's a person, when it's a topic, when it's an address, when it's a this. Right. Um, so on this one, I think you can see a little bit. I had to make decisions like what to do when they would write kanji, you know, that I, I could try to find somebody who could say what that was or how do I encode that. And instead, because I had to finish this thing and figure it out, there's a there's a way to say that it's a gap. So the, excuse me. There's a there's a way it's called a gap in this encoding thing so that it's saying that. Um, this part is not encoded. There's a gap. So if I were using an archival letter that had like a big water stain or was torn, I would identify that as a gap. So I just used the gap for any of the um, handwritten kind of uh, Japanese 
Chinese. They were language scholars, so they had a lot of conversations about Chinese and Japanese language dictionaries. They would make dictionaries and stuff. Uh, so, so my project was having to learn that and having to write it, but it's essentially just files. And so this site is a site that I found a project that was in beta, and what they do is render it, display your encoding. And it's not fully functional. That's why it's highlighted, but it's not quite... There should be something hovering there uh, because the project, the, the technology I wanted to use, there's encoding and then you have to have a way to display them and a program that will make use of all that tagging I did. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And again, that's where it was a much larger project than just the capstone. So I did encode a few letters. I made this kind of like database of names and um, topics and people that appear in the letters so that I could kind of do the cross-referencing. Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't building a display you know, mechanism. So I found this thing that will show it a little bit online just to kind of play with. Um, but I'm, I can't quite see, but otherwise, so my document has some information. I can pull up the others' projects here. Oh my gosh, I can't see the cursor. There's Megan's project. Uh -huh. You want to talk about? Uh, sure. Here, I, can this. I can turn the screen. No, no, it? it's fine. So this is like the. Oh, shit. Uh huh. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> no, it's fine. Your project, Megan. <laughs> oh, we lost it. So, but so my entry on there, like, there's a document, and mm -hmm. then there's a bunch of XML files. Mm -hmm. That's fine just files. So I basically not, submitted not. files and and a document. So that that's what I ended up oh, you know submitting. submitting. Yeah. So it's not really It's it's not an it's actual not. project yet because okay. the the so you'll amount, do that later or yeah, the, yeah, that's yeah. the idea that later so you would act, you could you'd even sort of have the uh, the letters displayed differently like sort of like more graphically so it's not just a plain letter yeah i mean the idea was that it, you could kind of point and click and jump through different um so if i only cared about reading um about the little tokyo newspaper the rafu shimpo um that they were dealing with the type of that the actual type from the newspaper place because of this whole thing so there's like Tens of letters where they discuss this newspaper, and it's like that might be interesting for people. Who, I know that people have studied, you know, the Japanese American community and newspapers and all of this stuff. Um, so being able to pull that out, but it's you know, yeah, I could do it forever. It'll never be done. <laughs> oh, could I really quickly? Sorry, there's a sign-up sheet there. So if you had RSVP, you can just check your name off. But if you didn't RSVP, you can. What happened? Name. It just oh know. I I I moved it and it got disconnected so I thought I would turn it off yeah oh. yeah um, so do you guys want to just spend a second telling us a little yeah. bit more about your projects and then and I already went into all that. <laughs> sure uh, I have a hard time talking about my project because I don't really know what I did um, <laughs> right, what does honestly, it look like it's <laughs> that's a good question so uh, are you it's a text right? it is yeah it's a text but it's a series of fragments in which I'm incorporating like experimental writing poetry creative nonfiction so it's just flowing in and out of different genres and I'm also utilizing very heavily Winnicott who's a psychoanalytic thinker so I'm interspersing his ideas and having that be a theoretical framework for me in order to sort of like support my own um, creative writing, which is mainly um, looking at my own like internal world and my mental health, my experience with my mother and my family, and just like interspersing that with with various theoretical frameworks, mainly from a psychoanalytic. Um, and it's bent. all flowing uh, text, mm -hmm. like um, just in uh, sequentially. It right. Is, it isn't sort of like it's definitely like marginal. Right. Or right. Anything. No. It's all like this. A it's very sequential, but it's like so I it's said. Like it's a, is it like stream of consciousness writing, Some, and you're sort of going in and out and somewhat? It kind of jumps around a lot, so it's not very fluid necessarily. I mean, certain parts mm -hmm. are going to be more fluid, but it's definitely because it's stream of consciousness is going to jump from different topic to topic. So you're kind of like jumping around a little bit and, and it's very somewhat ambiguous. So you're not quite sure 
because I'm not quite sure what I'm writing about in terms of my like psyche and my internal world and my mental health. I'm not quite sure what I'm getting at. So the reader doesn't quite know what I'm getting at either. So it's sort of this like ambiguous exploration of my mental health, like through a psychoanalytic lens. Say So sounds a lot more complicated than it is. Okay. It's just kind of a muddled piece of writing. Yeah, that sounds but, really interesting. Um, I think for my project, I mean, let me give you guys like a back, a little background on Maxine Hawkinson and her memoir. So it's, and there's debates over the years about whether or not this is considered autobiography or is it, you know, just uh, fiction writing or is it like a little bit of both, right? So it's uh, it's broken down to five chapters and it's sort of about this girl um, who grew up in uh, Cali and sort of her upbringing and how she grew up being Asian American in this little town. And her family likes to tell her all these stories, right, about, you know, mythology and also stories from back home in China and all these, like, myths, right? And she never could quite tell, you know, what is real and what is sort of just stories. So she goes into tangent about, you know, writing about this um, this lost aunt, right, who committed suicide. And it's like, well, what really happened to this aunt? And then she writes about this myth about, you know, this woman warrior, you know, who, um, you know, braves a storm and then comes back and kills this horrible emperor. Um, and then she writes about her, um, her other aunt, who is sort of her mother's sister, and how it, when by coming to the States here, um, she ended up, you know, kind of just losing herself a little bit over the years. And so that's kind of the backdrop of it. And kind of when me coming in, right? It's more about, okay, well, I've had similar experiences, right? That I could kind of relate to, but sort of like, how is my experience relatable to Maxine Hong Kingston's sort of narrative? And how would I play around with um, language and be able to experiment with my own writing um, to kind of retell a similar narrative, but in a different way or different format. Mm -hmm. So that was where the project came in. and. Then at the end, the white paper piece was me trying to connect it to, and sort of that was where I explained, you know, how certain things were able to link together and sort of what my approach was like and sort of like what my writing process, um, what was it that I found out or discovered about myself um, and sort of, and then connecting it back to a little bit of research, I would say. So it's very minimal there in terms of sort of uh, some of the, I guess, dialogue that's already there um, around Maxine. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, kind of have a question about like depositing the white paper and submitting the um, project. Yeah. So, if the project is like a non-digital format, then like who do I like submit it to, and like is the deadline the same as the white paper? Because I know it's like the almost like. So, a, can you just explain what your project yes. is? Yes. Well, I'm in fashion studies. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I do. Um, I work as a fashion designer. So I'm not like quite sure, but maybe it's going to be like a portfolio or like a garment or a sample or some kind of a more of a hard, like actual like project instead yeah. of like digitized. Mm -hmm. So I'm like... So Roxanne is actually the perfect person oh. to talk to. <laughs> right. She is the yeah. one who handles these questions. Um, yes. And um, so I would say close to that is recently there was a capstone where the student had kind of recreated a high school binder right. trapper keeper. That was the project. So it was very kind of material. Mm -hmm. So it was life writing, I think. And um, there was an actual binder that had, you know, different kind of collages and different mm -hmm. telling the story. Um, and so early on, she and her advisor contacted the library to say, well, what is what are we going to submit here? And does that mean she has to give up the binder? <laughs> you know, like, is it going to live in the library? Um, our library does not have an archives mm -hmm. and a conservation and preservation group mm -hmm. like many libraries mm -hmm. would. So we just weren't uh, kind of equipped, equipped, mm -hmm. yeah, to to pr give it the kind of preservation <coughs> and also access. We don't have a reading room necessarily that somebody would come and look at this original object. Mm -hmm. So we decided that we would accept a, we called it a digital facsimile. Mm -hmm. So basically a high quality scan of the cover and every single page mm -hmm. 
that's what the library would keep. Um, and this was decided in consultation with the advisor as well. Serve some version of it. Because the idea of the, the capstone, I think, and you, you can speak to this, Karen, uh, is a, a, a research project that can be more ephemeral. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I, I guess they, we've spoken sometimes about the idea of performance or something, mm-hmm. you know, and, and what kind of capturing of that research we need to have to provide to other people. So it's really like a one by one or, or yeah, as case by case basis. Sorry, just one yeah. more question. So if I do like a portfolio, then I like submit it to the library and then you will scan it? No, no. So, I mean, well, we'd have to work it out. So I guess the, the answer is that you should talk with your advisor and, and then contact me as well to figure out what makes sense for what your project is. I mean, if it's a lot of different material things that we can't necessarily preserve, then... Yeah. So I'm like um, similarly have like an art arts background. <laughs> if I were to like curate like an exhibition, mm-hmm. let's say in like a small gallery space, then what is like the thing that I'm submitting? Is it just like the white paper and like documentation from the event or? Right. Yeah. I mean, some of that is again talked about with the advisor and the the program. You know, Karen and and Lizzie, um, the library will try to save whatever is makes the most sense. You create right. a catalog. Right, right. Rare exhibition. There have been people who have done um, photography mm-hmm. without any kind of exhibit or even um, somebody submitted poems and images, and the images weren't actually, it was, the whole point was not to present them in a specific way, like not to actually collect them in a book, like a catalog or anything like that. She just wanted the photo files, just the files. Mm -hmm. No presentation of them Mm -hmm. because that's how the advisor had, you know, they looked at the actual photographs. Mm -hmm. And since we, Mm -hmm. so it was, it was, but we work with it, right? We work with whatever makes sense for the So you just had a bunch of files? We have a bunch of um, JPEGs and Mm -hmm. yeah, and um, the text and the white paper and, you know, all of these pieces. But ordinarily, we would say, oh, just put the, you know, the other people who've done photographs, they put them in a PDF, and then we can view the photographs mm-hmm. that way. Uh, but for this person, because the creative process that they had gone through, it was mm-hmm. like they weren't to be put in a PDF. So we <laughs> kept the photographs. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll do what we can. Are, are, the, are capstones graded? Are, are, are they graded? Or no, is thesis just... and capstones are not graded. So you, you will register for something called thesis advising with your thesis advisor, um, and that's a pass-fail class. And so you'll pass the class when you submit your thesis. Oh, I see. Interesting. And it, it gets approved by the program as yeah. well. So yeah, that's yeah. why bringing all these people in conversation when you're thinking about what am I going to submit and what's, yeah. what's going to count for this. Um, it's good to think about that. Are yeah. there currently um, like capstone projects that are... Because I, I like looked through that database a bit, um, and I was trying to like look for ones that... Like, illustrations or like something with like um like a visual do you see a lot of those or most of the time people use a website for that type mm-hmm. of just medium okay right so the the trapper keeper was new for us the idea that they really wanted a material mm-hmm. like physical um and then and then putting images into a pdf is usually okay. if you're not going to put it online but a lot of people with the visual or um, there was the one uh, that was done using the story maps, the GIS. Mm-hmm. You know, um, what's her name? What's her name? But it was about. Um, it was called. It was about campus sexual violence, mm-hmm. and and it was this great, like you know, visual and textual, like scrolling website kind of experience. Um, so they can get creative. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Could be a PowerPoint too, right? I have had PowerPoints submitted. That's true, because we can we can accommodate most file types. Um, you had also asked when is it due. So the um, so the due dates are the same for the capstones. So the basically the capstones and theses are due 
on January 10th if you're registered for the fall, and then if you're registered for the spring, either April 10th if you want to graduate in May or August 25th if you want to graduate in October. Um, and those are the dates that they're due to us and they're due to the MALS program about three weeks before the, the ultimate library deposit date. Um, but that's really the final approved version that you need to give to the MALS program so that we can confirm that, it, that you should deposit it in the library. Do people have more questions? Um, yeah, I just have one last question. So, yeah. um, it's like way it's like very early for me to like you know like to start talking to professors looking for an advisor. It's um, never too early. Never. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, I had people in my intro class who that semester were like, I kind of think that maybe I want you to be my advisor, and then I just continue to have relationships with them until they start writing the thesis. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Because I know that your professor, like, they can dedicate, like, one semester to, like, advising you, right? So, so that means, um, I mean, you're asking a really good question. So, so faculty get paid for one semester to advise you, and they get a fifth of a class for it. Okay. So for every five students that they advise, they get a course off, um, which is quite substantial. And so, um, but I, but for me, um, when I work with students, I imagine that a project will take about six, about six to eight months. So for example, I'm working with somebody now who I'm meeting every few weeks who is planning to deposit in April. Mm -hmm. um, but we really started meeting in October. Um, so even though I'm gonna get the credit to advise her in the spring semester, I wanna be meeting with her now so that we can really talk about where she's going with the project. Okay. Um, People the, typically don't do it in a semester, is what you're saying. People typically don't do it in a semester. It's pretty unusual. Like, did any of you do it in a, in a semester? You did it in a semester? I did, yeah. But you said it was a semester and a half. I mean, because technically I used a paper that I wrote for a previous class to, mm -hmm. like, help expand upon. But Had I, you started working with your advisor that, that previous no. semester? Mm -hmm. So I, I technically only worked on it for one semester. Yeah. I mean, that definitely happens. Yeah. Um, <laughs> people definitely do it more quickly. Yeah. Like somebody, we had somebody on a capstone panel and she was like, I did the whole thing in six weeks. Um, so there's that version also. Um, it depends on the project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It depends on the project and your process and mm -hmm. what your advisor wants from you and stuff like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. If you need advice on like like scoping your like project because um, cause I know what my, like kind of vaguely know what my topic is, but it's just like there's so much out there, I've like started doing research and reading, but if I need advice on that, do I just like speak to our like advising fellows? And you should really find an advisor, okay. um, because the pro the project, you'll see once you get an advisor that it will be really helpful. So like you have an idea in mind, and you have like a million ways that you can go, and you're starting to do research. But that's why it's useful to talk to an advisor, is because then they can be like, oh, it sounds like this is what you're interested in. And then you can be like, no, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm actually interested in this. But it's through that dialogue that you'll be able to narrow the scope of what you're interested in and figure out where you're headed. Um, it, so, I mean, I'm giving you that advice because that's what could what would be useful to me. Um, but, but it's also possible, like I was very clear about that, but you don't need to also, because it's possible that you're having a pretty good time kind of like feeling around and figuring out what you want to do and that you're not interested in finding an advisor to be part of those conversations until a little bit later. Um, so it's really up to you. But if you are feeling at all like it could be useful to be in dialogue with somebody about this, um, but you don't want to find an advisor because it's too early, that, that, that second half isn't right. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that they're going to start meeting with you every couple of weeks, two years before you write your thesis. But even just like a couple of, you know, I have some students who, um, like I have a student now who I know we're going to be working together in the spring and he's come to my office hours like twice this semester. So we're not meeting a lot. He's not really starting very, very significantly. Well, he's doing his, one of his final papers um, is going to go into the thesis. Um, but like, I know that in the spring we'll meet more often, but we still are, have been in dialogue about the project for longer. Um, but it really is your preference, um, what feels right, you know? And I think that it was really nice to hear from this panel that that they're looking for different things than an advisor. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, does I, that I, sound right? Yeah, I mean, I think I really agree. Um, because, um, I think it's good to just speak with different faculty members in the mm-hmm. very beginning to get a sense of, well, whether or not that faculty can potentially be your advisor, but also kind of learn a little bit about yourself, right? About what your interests are. Because I mean, I never thought I was as interested about teaching and like you know pedagogy, but um, as I started to sit down with one of my professors and he was you know, you're really interested about higher ed and teaching methods. I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't realize that. It was just, it just kind of happened um, like in that semester when I took a course with him and we had these meetings, right? And then as later on when I found Nancy, right, that was when I was like, oh my goodness, the, like there's so much written about Maxine. I could do things, um, I could do psychoanalysis. I could like do about um, teaching Asian American literature in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's like gender studies and there's like queer studies right, written about it. And I'm like, what do I do, you know? And Nancy was really good about kind of helping me to sort of like take things out Mm -hmm. um, and kind of like help me rediscover myself a little bit. Yeah. Could you collaborate? Like, for instance, in, in, I'm sorry to single you out, but it's it's really, all of the projects are intriguing. Might you have been able to collaborate, let's let's say, with... um, uh, just a new media artist and who might have worked with you mm-hmm. and you, you know you, you put your whole project together and they were the ones that sort of created this graphical design and worked with the HTML or they got separate coder in and right and well so I mean part of it was the 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 approach to my project I mentioned that I had just finished library school so I was really interested in what in in Kind of figuring out the difference between a librarian doing this work and um, a not librarian and so this idea of digital history as a field where they're doing similar encoding work and making these decisions that are classifying and discovery related uh, i wanted to kind of experience it from the non-library view and and part of my writing was about trying to figure out what the difference is um, in the approach and, and for me, the difference was that historians do a lot more interpretation than librarians are willing to, to do because they want to like have all people be able to use this, not just listen to what I have to say. right? So there were different approaches, and the experience of doing the digital part um, is what I was aiming for. It wasn't to have this like beautiful thing. It was really about me going through the experience of the digital process. And so that was, that's really your thesis. Yeah, I mean, that's what I discuss anyway. Um, so, you know, one day it would maybe make a very nice finished digital project, but that wasn't really my goal. But you might have, but so it's, you're not really precluded from actually working with other collaborators who, who might format things or. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a, um, it, there's like the Digital Humanities Lab here, right? Um, so there, there's the new media lab as well. I lab. looked at working there. Um, there's there's like fellows and people fellows, who will help yeah. advise, and work through the technical stuff. But I mean, it's um, I mean the question of collaborating is interesting because you're not allowed to have co-authors to this kind of mm-hmm. degree requirement. Mm-hmm. So you're excuse me. You're not allowed to have co-authors. No, they wouldn't. Right that's now. That you're you would be the content provider, but they would they would you know create all the graphical interviews right. for you. Right. And you know, but I mean, would, I guess I'm just, I don't know what's appropriate for uh, this kind of a project. Like, mm-hmm. if you were just talking about how to get my project finished as a project in the world, then definitely looking for people to collaborate with in that way. Uh, but to complete the degree requirement, I wouldn't necessarily be yeah, looking. Yeah, I think so. I I agree with Roxanne. So you wouldn't want to be hiring somebody to do the coding if you did a digital capstone um, because Mm -hmm. the point of the digital capstone is for you to produce it, even if it might have a life after after it's your capstone and you would hire somebody to, like, complete that work. So what if you wanted to make a documentary? You would have to shoot it and edit it yourself? Yeah, we have had people make films, and they, they produce the films. Yeah. There's no collaboration at all, like, collaboratively. 
Um, so what are you thinking about? I'm not thinking about I'm just trying to clear. Yeah, it's like, what if you were doing a performance and, well, and you had a, perf you weren't, you didn't want to be the performer, but you had written, done this life writing. Yeah, and you were like a director and stuff and, like yeah, that. Yeah, you're directing. Yeah, so I mean, I guess, it, I guess, I guess, someone um, else perform. I guess when you were asking about a digital project, usually digital projects, the project is the digital project. Um, right? So like, if you want to direct a film and you need people to help you produce it, like the project is you directing the film. So you wouldn't want to co-direct the film, but you could certainly collaborate with other people on the film. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're um, saying. I but I do think that it's yeah. very personal. So whatever you come up with in dialogue with your thesis advisor and with the program, we could just figure it out. Oh, okay. I mean, I guess one other thing I might want to add is I don't know how many of you are up to that this uh, capstone stage, uh, but that semester you may or may not be taking another class along with the capstone. So you might want to think about you know that other class that you're taking, um, how much weight, right? I mean, so what I did uh, since I was doing this life writing project, I took a life writing course. Um, so in that sense, a lot of the work I was already doing in that class kind of correlated with my project. So it helped um, a lot. So, I mean, I know in the math program, we kind of encourage students to kind of explore right, and kind of um, figure out what you want. But I think that very last semester, it's not time for you to explore. <laughs> it's time for you to get down and get this project done, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever that second course you're going to take, Find something that either you're maybe really uh, uh, is already familiar with, right, or something that you think um, might go hand in hand with the whatever project it is that you're working on. So it will help you in the end. Do people have other questions, or do you want to talk about your projects that you're working on? Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. <laughs> So the